Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Good morning. How are you? Good to see you. Have you heard of the Madden curse? I just found out about it this morning. I was talking to somebody because the draft has been going on and they said, you know, my one of my players might end up being who just, you know, who just uh, got nominated for the cover of this video game, Madden NFL. The curse goes like this, I guess, back in uh, uh, almost 20 years ago. in the 90s, the, whoever was put featured on the cover of that video game always ended up with a significant injury, 17 of the 19 with a, with not career ending, but season ending injury. And so now they're saying, uh, people who, their fans are going, don't, don't be on the cover, you know. And it, it actually, it's, you can bet in, in, uh, in Las Vegas who's likely to be injured and how bad it will if they end up on the cover. So you might be wondering, if you're, uh, well, if you're into football, uh, is, it, is it possible that one of my people could be on? Well, here's the five leading contenders at this point. Uh, number one, Tom Brady. Now, you might be thinking, that's fine with me. Let him be on there, man. <laughs> with the New England Patriots, Matt Ryan. He's another contender with the Atlanta Falcons. Julio Jones, Atlanta Falcons as well. Dak Prescott, Dallas Cowboys. And Ezekiel Elliott. Dallas Cowboys. So those are the five contenders. One of those guys are likely to be on there. So um, is that a real curse? I mean, is that a curse like the curse of the Bambino that went on for 86 years or the curse of the Billy Goat that went on for 71 years or the Cubs? I mean, are these real things, these curses that just get passed down? I don't know, right? But Uh, Some people would say they swear by them. They're not just superstition. They go, well, look, look. Well, you know, there's something that goes on in family systems that are similar, that they are real. There's, there's, There's these things that get passed down that are not positive things. And we can see them. I mean, it doesn't take a brain, a, a, you know, a brain surgeon to figure it out. You look, at, you look at yourself, you look at one of your parents and then their parent and their parent, and you go, man, this has been in our family lineage. Well, we're in a series called Family mess, okay? Families are messy. And we uh, last week just kicked it off. If you missed that, vineyardchurch.com, you'll want to see it. Pastor Sharon did a phenomenal job talking about generational sin. But that really is a, <clears throat> a recurring theme. When you look at the families of the patriarchs, which is in the, specifically we're gonna, looking at Genesis in the Old Testament, <clears throat> you see families that are messy. Families that have this, this thing that gets passed on. Some of it not so good. Some of it, some of it is good. And, and we're looking at that and saying, you know, these ancient stories really, a whole lot of that hasn't changed from today. We have those same things in our family dynamics. So we're going to look at, look at that story, <clears throat> one story in particular, Genesis 27. If you have your Bible, you'll open that up and, and uh, open your Bible app up. Of course, it's going to be on the side screens. It's in your outline as well. And follow along. <clears throat> We're going to look at uh, kind of what happens there in, uh, in a story where, uh, where you have this, um, this, this, uh, this, it, this thing that's emotionally gripping. It's, like, it's, it's not just a curse. It's not like standing back. It's not like a sports game. It's like somebody's really being hurt in the process of this. If you've been in that situation, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I think of like, uh, this is one of the most emotionally invoking stories in the Bible. One of them would be King David when his son 
uh, betrayed him, and then he ends up having to kill his son, and then he's crying out, you know, oh, my son, he died. I can't believe it. And you just read that, and it's like gripping. Well, this is another similar one where you have these two uh, uh, siblings, Esau and Jacob, and one steals his blessing from his father, Isaac, and he comes to grips and he goes, this, this has been ripped out of my life and there's a bro broken relationship now. <clears throat> Look at this with me. Pull out your, if, you're, if you're reading with your outline, it's a little confusing. You go to the front, the front of it, go to the very bottom, and we're going to begin with the last sentence. That's a little odd, I know, but um, something got messed in the works there. So the last sentence very beginning. It says, after Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, my father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, who are you? He's really old. He can't even see. I am your son, he answered. Your firstborn, <clears throat> Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him. He's talking about his, Esau's brother, Jacob. And indeed, he will be blessed when Esau heard this, his father's words. He burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? Jacob means swindler. <clears throat> now, why you'd name your kid swindler, I'm not sure. But he gets renamed later on, so that's kind of a cool part of the story. So he goes, isn't he rightly named Jacob? <clears throat> this is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright, and now he's taking my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you received any blessing from me? Isaac answered Esau, I've made him lord over you. And I have made all his relatives his servants. And I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you only have one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. <clears throat> then Esau wept aloud. It's a, just a sad thing. You can almost picture this. Dad, can't you bless me? Mom, can't you bless? Can't you, don't you have any blessing for me? It's heartbreaking. And then you see it. <clears throat> lived out in his life, broken relationship between him and his brother, and then also continuing in the generations with the same kind of painful thing that happened in his life, and then he starts to, to live out those decisions that, that came with that. <clears throat> well, I want to I read the whole story. That's why it's there. I know it's a lot of re reading, but it's really just one story. So, Follow with me. We're going to now begin at the very top of your outline. This is Genesis 27, verse 1. Here we go. <clears throat> when Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he, could, that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son. So Esau was the older one. Jacob was the younger one, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, Rebekah, this is Isaac's wife, was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare some tasty food to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to, his, to Rebekah, his mother, but... My brother Esau is a hairy man. Well, I have smooth skin. He's saying, no, we've got a problem here, you know. He's, he's a, has all this hair. I don't have that kind of hair. He's going to know. He says, why? Because he's going to touch me. He's going to get close enough to touch, and he knows that. 
He goes, I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say, go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau's older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son so that he would look like him and smell like him. She also covered his hands and smooth part of his neck with goat skin. I guess he was pretty hairy. If it, goat skin feels the same way, you know, you think, you got some hair there. Then she handed to her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. She went to his father and said, my father, he went to his father and said, my father, yes, my son, he answered, who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Of course, he's, he's deceiving him or he's trying to, I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, how did you find it so quickly? You know, he's up, he's on to it. Something's going on here, my son. The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come near so I can touch you, my son. I know whether to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father, Isaac who touched him and said, the voice, of the, uh, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, <clears throat> for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau? He asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat, <clears throat> so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him, and he ate. And he brought some wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew on earth's riches and abundant of, abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you <clears throat> be blessed. So we have in this story, uh, it's, a, it's a family mess. And two things pop out. One is it's a, it's a story of deception. It's a story of deception. And we see this, <clears throat> this grooved out pattern of, of generational sin of deception, of lying. Uh, you have this with Abraham. Abraham, who was Jacob's grandfather, he lied. He uh, told people that his wife was really his sister so that he wouldn't have to be harmed. He was afraid that maybe somebody would harm him because his wife was very beautiful. And so instead of tr trusting God when he was in danger, when things didn't look good for him, he would lie instead of tell the truth and believe God would protect him and watch over him. And then the same thing happened with Abraham's son. Abraham's son, Isaac, same thing. He had his wife in a, in, in, in a particular situation, and he lied, just like his dad did. And he lied and said, well, she's my sister, instead of trusting God. And now you have here not just Abraham and Isaac, but now you have Jacob doing the same thing. He's deceiving. He's lying. And then you just further down the story, you have Jacob's Sons, they lie and they deceive Jacob because they sold Joseph into slavery. But instead of telling him the truth, they lied. And part of their deception was, it's interesting that both of Jacob and, and Jacob's kids used, used a slain animal to deceive. Jacob here, this, this goat that was slain and he put the, uh, the skin on his arms and on his neck. And then you have the same thing with uh, with the, with the brothers of Joseph, they took a, a coat of many colors that was on Joseph. It was, he always wore it. They, they took it off him, sold him into slavery. Sla they slew a goat, dipped the blood in there, and said there was some violent animal who had killed your son. So you have this, this lineage of deception. If somebody were to maybe write, you know, a title of what, you know, the patriarchs' lives were like, it would be a, a family of liars, in part at least. I mean, that's partly what's going on here. There's other things, but that's part of what's happening. 
I mean, let me ask you, <clears throat> if somebody were looking at your family, let's say they're going to write a book about your family lineage, I'm, what, what do you think they would say about it? What, what would be the title? For some of you, it might be a family of alcoholics. You know, it goes back, you just, as far back as you can remember. Maybe it's a family of domestic abuse. You know, you've struggled with domestic abuse, and your dad abused you, and his dad abused him, and as far back as you can go. Maybe a family of divorce, and just everybody seems to divorce. There's a type. It doesn't have to be bad, though. You could also have good things can be passed down. It might be a family of musicians, family of of, of athletes, a family of people who serve in public, in, in some kind of public service in some way. I mean, there's, there's different titles, but thinking of that, what would it be like? And see, this is something that does get passed down. There is something very powerful that gets passed down, and it goes back as far as we can see. This, this idea of, um, of uh, here it's deception, but it can be something else. It can be something else. One of the things that I think is the most powerful lineage we can pass on is a family of serving Jesus, serving the Lord. Now, I grew up in a family that they, we, nobody knew the Lord. I came to Christ when I was 18. Sharon came to Christ at 18. Her mom led her to Christ, but her mom had just recently come to Christ. She, so she really grew up in a home that really wasn't a, a Christ-filled home. And so we're, certainly me, I'm a first-generation Christian. I had no no kind of guidance of how it all works and make, make it work. So I had, to, I had to read books, Dr. Dobson's, and I had to, you know, how do you parent as, in a, as a Christ follower? It, was, it wasn't modeled for me. But I'm, I, I'm hoping that now that my kids are second generation believers and then their kids, and that's something that could be passed on, a powerful, powerful legacy. And, and, and it, it, there's something great that can happen from that. So you have this story of deception. It's also a story of favoritism. This is obviously going on here, this idea of favoritism. Abraham and Sarah both had their own favorite son. Isaac was Abraham's favorite son. Jacob was Rebekah's favorite son. This really gets teased out well in this verse here in verses 5 and 6. It says, now Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. It's both of their kids, but it's his son at this point. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son, Jacob, look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau. And so you have this, this favoritism. And favoritism is a real thing, right? I mean, how many of you would say, I, in my family growing up, if you had siblings, that I had, uh, that there was favoritism. Either you were the favorite or you were not the favorite. Let me see you raise your hands. If you, yeah, I mean, you look around. There's a lot of favoritism's a very real thing, right? And really nobody's the winner. But what happens is, as a parent, often will feel more alignment towards one kid. I mean, there's just, a, they, they just connect. Maybe there's certain activities they both enjoy. There's certain temperaments. Maybe they're both, you know, they both love fishing and hunting and outdoors. And this is kind of what's going on here with Isaac and Esau. They were both hunters and they loved going outdoors and, and, uh, and, and being, you know, kind of a man's man type thing. And Jacob wasn't, he wasn't interested in that. So he didn't, so Isaac had a hard time evidently connecting with him at that level. That certainly comes from this story in Genesis 27. But it can come from that. It can come from just similar interests. I just get her. I just get him. And often it's the same gendered uh, uh, child or grandchild if you're, a grand, if you're a grandparent raising a grandchild. And it's just, oh, I just connect with them. And, or maybe they remind you of you. Or maybe they remind you of one of your siblings that you really were really close to and you got along really well. And you just like being around them. And it's just, so hard around the other ones and <clears throat> you find yourself distancing and what happens is often as a kid, especially the one who is unfavored, will feel like I'm not loved as much. And there's no doubt that hurts and, and, and there, there is a distinction though between just not connecting as well but next thing you know, you really just don't love them as much. You'd probably never admit it as a parent or a grandparent but that's really the way it's working itself out and 
those signals are clearly caught by that unfavored kid, and they just don't feel, wow, I'm not as loved. And, 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 and then the, what ends up happening is they grow up, they leave the house, they end up often living kind of for approval, and it ends up hurting other relationships. Maybe as a kid, they find themselves lashing out, they're aggressive, maybe they struggle with self-esteem issues, they might have problems in school and academia, and then it's no better really for the favored kid. The favored kid is the one who kind of lives with this idea of, of entitlement, you know, that everybody owes them. They always get away with everything. They get away with murder. Mom and dad don't care. They don't say anything, or at least the one that they're connected to doesn't. And the other siblings always get the bill, whatever it is. And then they go into life with that attitude, and that ends up hurting them, because that's not a real healthy way to look at, look at relationships. So it's not helpful. So listen, if that's where you're at, I might be, you know, I'm talking about favoritism. That is a painful thing. If you're at the raw end of that deal, as I'm talking, you're going, that doesn't feel good, man. I mean, that kind of opens up a little bit of a wound there that I don't really like to look at. And let me say, that is painful. There's no doubt about it. It ruptures relationships. It causes all kinds of problems. And here's what I want to ask you. If you're an unfavored kid, if you feel like that's you, then I invite you to go to the Lord. Go to God and say, God, that didn't feel very good. And specifically name it. Say, I've acted out in these ways. I've looked for approval in these ways. And it's because I'm always struggling for approval because I was the unfavored one. The un, it felt like the unloved one. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but certainly it felt that way. And then the next step is to offer forgiveness and say, I am going to forgive my parent or my parents for treating me that way, for, for treating me with this unfavored type of attitude. And you offer forgiveness. The Bible says when we forgive, I opened up talking about the curse of Madden or the curse that is on some baseball teams and is it real and can it be broken? Well, there, there is a way to break family curses. There is a way to break generational sin and that's through forgiveness. Amen. That's the power of it. it for, for, from, the, from the secular mind, it looks like weakness. But I am telling you, there is a spiritual reality when you forgive, it breaks it. It cuts it off. And so you just offer forgiveness. You say, God, I forgive them. I forgive them. And you name it. You're specific about it. You also may need to forgive the sibling who is the favorite one. Because it takes two to tango. And you're thinking to yourself, hey, they, they reciprocated in all of that. There was some distance that was created and a lot of the pain that I feel my sibling participated in that, and so forgiveness extends to them as well. Now, sometimes you look, at, you know, you can forgive, and that does break the, 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 how it continues on, but it doesn't change the past, right? There could be years, maybe decades of, of like, wasted years, you know, that you'll never get back. How do you move on from that? Well, let me tell you, there's no simple answer to that, but it involves a certain level of, of, of mourning, of just recognizing that is gone, and then acceptance. Saying, well, you know, I'm going to accept the new reality where I, I can't change the past. But you can't get to acceptance if you, don't, if you don't mourn for that. There is a place for grieving, grieving something that's lost. And as we really look at it, see, if we don't want to look at it, we just move on with life, then we, we never have to go there. But if you want to break that, if you want to get healthy, if you want to change things in your life, it can be a challenge. It can be a challenge, right? And sometimes favoritism is not grandiose things. Sometimes favoritism is something just very small. You know, just a little teeny thing. And it just see, but even small things can collect. I want... I like this show called Blackish. I don't know if you've seen it. I've seen all three seasons, all the episodes. I love it. I think it, it, it's, it's a great show. And uh, so I wanted to show you a brief video clip from that. The father, who's played by Anthony Anderson, in this, actually throughout, this, throughout the episodes, he shows favoritism. So he has his oldest daughter that he, he is his favorite, his youngest daughter. He's always kind of putting her down. And, and in, one, in one of these situations, what he does is he calls her Gurkle 
because she got glasses at one point. And so this, it's kind of a lifelong prank. And uh, it's because he said, you know, now she looks like Steve Urkel from uh, Family Matters, and so thus Gurkel. And, and all of a sudden, the older daughter needs glasses, so the, the younger daughter thinks, oh, this is my chance. I can give up this, this title. But she's so young, she doesn't, she doesn't get it. She doesn't realize all the favoritism, so, so the, the father just embraces the Gurkel name with, in a good way. And she goes, oh, no, I didn't realize it was good. I thought it was bad, but really, it's favoritism. Watch this. She's not, she's figuring it out. I know something's wrong. I don't want to, I don't know what it is. Listen, if you're a parent or you're a grandparent and you're participating in favoritism, then you, you'll want to stop that. You'll want to, hey, I want, and you can do that with God's help. You just go to the Lord and say, God, help me. Help me to see that. And then it might involve you going to your son, your daughter, your grand, one of your grandkids and saying, you know what? I've, I, I really have done some favoritism here and I'm sorry about that. Would you forgive me? Boy, would that do a lot. It's a lot easier as a parent to go and do that than waiting for your kid to do that. And that can really open up healing in that relationship. Now, it's not a story just a family mess, but also a story of blessing. And so uh, look at this. Going back to the top of your outline, very first verse, it says, When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could, do, that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son... Here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now old, an old man, and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me for this kind of tasty food I like, and bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing before I die. So the deathbed blessing was, was something comparable to today what we would consider our last will and testament. And uh, in those days, the firstborn son got a double portion. So if you only had two sons, it would have been two-thirds to Esau, one-third to Jacob. But even beyond that, with the patriarchs, it was, it was a blessing where the Messiah, it was, God was going to use the salvation of the world through the patriarchs and their lineage. So he's saying, okay, you're going to get two-thirds of my estate. You'll also be in charge of the family, the, 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 my, my wife when I die, and, and any of the kids that are still at home. And, and then also over the nations, because you're going to, God's going to use your lineage to bless the nations. This is why he doesn't have another blessing to give. I mean, he's, he, you know, it's this great blessing that was unique to the patriarchs, and he's blessing his, his son with this uh, with this amazing blessing. But he, of course, he tricked him to get it, and there was favoritism, all that stuff that was going on. But there is a blessing that's part of it. You know, there's a, there was a great book that was written a number of, of years ago, a book on blessing, and millions of copies were sold. It's called uh, The Blessing by Gary Smalley and John Trent. And it talks about, it's mainly for parenting, about how to be a blessing to your kids, how to really bless them. And they took Genesis 27, really, and unpacked that and found five elements that go in to a blessing. But it's not just for parents. If you're single and you're connected closely to maybe uh, as an uncle or a niece, I mean, uh, you know, to your niece or your nephew as an uncle or an aunt. I mean, there, there's many ways, or as a grandparent, there's many ways that you can be a blessing into your small group, Ways to bless people. And here's the five things, five elements of a blessing that we see from this chapter. Number one is meaningful touch. Meaningful touch. You have the, all throughout the Bible, you have the blesser touching the blessee as part of the, the blessing to happen. It's a very powerful thing. And you see this all throughout Jesus' ministry as well. He's always touching people especially when he's healing them, even though they were the untouchables like the lepers of their day, nobody touched them. And Jesus would touch them. Here's one example. He says, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. It's the first time this guy's probably been touched in years, maybe decades. And Jesus touches him. He didn't have to, he does. He touches him because he's blessing him and that's part of the blessing. Here's another example. When Jesus blesses children, he says, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. There's the touching. Place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. 
When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God is like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them and blessed them. And so you see Jesus's ministry is doing this. And, and this is an area often where dads struggle, touching their kids in an appropriate way, of course, but touching them, blessing them, hugging them. Touch is, communicates enormous amounts of love. It's, and it, it's a form of blessing in and of itself if you didn't even say anything. Touching can be very powerful. Very powerful. One of the things I used to do when my kids were very young uh, is I would put, Sharon and I would put them to bed and as they were laying in bed before they fell asleep, I would go and I would lay hands on them, pray over each of them, if I could, every night. And we also would cite, we, I had taught the kids uh, Psalm 23, so we would recite that psalm where they would pray. But just that time, you know, and I found that time worked for me because I had three boys, they had a lot of energy. And th there wasn't really a good time throughout the day to say, hey, why don't you relax and I'm going to pray for you, you know. I mean, but at night in that little window, they were all snuggled up all, and they hadn't fallen asleep. They kind of, kind of were relaxing and in that place, was a window I would try to take advantage of and take an opportunity and bless them. But this can happen also not just in families, but in the body of Christ. The body of Christ, of course, is a family. In small groups, touching in prayer, holding hands in prayer. Uh, there's just, be, you know, putting your arm around somebody, saying, hey, I'm with you. And, I mean, and again, in appropriate ways. But touching can be a powerful, powerful way to communicate a blessing. Number two is the blessing has spoken words. Now, it's not just touching. It, there's spoken words involved in it. And where you speak to them, and you, uh, and, and, and it can be, it can, and you see this here with Isaac, speaking words of blessing. It's like the couple that went to marriage counseling, and, uh, and she said, you know, he, my husband just never tells me that he loves me. And the counselor goes, is that true to the husband? He goes, hey, listen, I told her I loved her on her wedding day. If anything changes, I'll let her know. You know? <laughs> well, that's, that's probably not the best pathway there. Regular, verbally spoken, I care about you, I love you, you're important, you're significant to me. Spoken words are a form of blessing to somebody. Third element of the blessing is words of high value. <clears throat> This is interesting here. So not just words. We can say words, but then thinking, I want to say, I want to lift their self-esteem. I want to show them something greater. It says in uh, this example, so Jacob went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of heaven's dew and earth's riches an abundance of grain and new wine. So, I mean, this made sense in his context. He's talking about wine and grain. I mean, you probably wouldn't say to your daughter, boy, you smell like a farm, you know, right? <laughs> you you, you got to be creative and come up with things that make sense in their context, in their culture, in their time. And, uh, but words of high value. It's, in, it's incredible when we are creative and we think and we, and, we, and we place on that. I believe in you. I think you can do something great you know, to your child or to your nephew or your grandkid or somebody in your small group. And just, there's something very powerful when you respect somebody and they see something great in you and they start speaking that. And that goes to the picture of a special future, the fourth element. In other words, he, Jacob was saying, I see you as being prosperous. I see you as having all of these you know, uh, cattle and vineyards and, and blessing the nations. I mean, that wasn't part of his matrix at that point, but from then on, it's, wow, you know, I'm, I'm walking out this great calling. It's amazing. I'm reading this book. Uh, it's a biography on Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther 500 years ago, started the Protestant Reformation. And he said that's what he felt like. There was a, right, as he, when he was in high school, there was a, a monk who had prophesied there was going to be somebody who comes after him who was going to challenge the Pope, challenge the status quo, and change everything. And Martin Luther read that and felt like that was, it was spoken to him. And he knew this guy, and, and, and he started fulfilling that promise. 
It can be a powerful thing to change your destiny when somebody speaks this picture of a special future. And then an active commitment to fulfill the blessing. Now, this is important. An active commitment. In other words, it's one thing to say, hey, I think you're going to, you know, you have some artistic abilities. I think you'll be great someday. It's another thing to say, you know what? I want you to go down to the artist store with me and I'm going to buy you some canvas and some paint brushes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you get there. I want to be invested in your great future. It's another thing to do that. I went uh, last month to a, uh, a little tech seminar uh, called Brain Candy at Chrysler Center with Adam Savage. He was one of the hosts. And he was talking, somebody had asked him, hey, how'd you end up getting, he's, you know, he's the guy on, uh, uh, what's the show? Yeah, Mythbusters. And so uh, he's, they said, how did you get into making all that stuff? He goes, well, my parents believed in me. They gave me a Lowe's credit card, or Home Depot, one of them, gave me a, a, a credit card when I was in elementary school. He goes, I think I was in first grade. And they would just say, buy whatever you want. And, they, and he goes, I never abused it, but I bought stuff, all, all kinds of stuff, learning to make stuff. They invested in him. See, they said, we see something great in you, but we're going to help you get there too. See, that is important as well, where you get behind them and you, uh, you're a commitment to help them fulfill that blessing. So let's review these. Meaningful touch. Here's to how you give a blessing. Meaningful touch. Spoken words. Attaching high value to the one being blessed. Picturing a special future on the one being blessed. And an active commitment to fulfill the blessing. See, you can be part of that. You can choose. You can say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I'm, I'm, and, and no matter where you're at, you may have not done that in the past. It doesn't. You can change today. You say, I'm going to be an active blesser in the people in my life. All of us have messy families. I've been pastoring for many, for decades, and every time I've talked to somebody, it's only a matter of time until mess starts oozing out. Sometimes, though, the mess is so predominant, we can't see the blessing in it. But listen, Jesus is in the midst of the mess. He is the blessing. When we look to Christ, he will help us draw out the blessing. Sometimes the mess goes away. Sometimes it gets better. Sometimes it doesn't. But God is, he says, I want to help you with that. I want to help you be the blessing and not just caught up in the mess part. Okay, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Well, Lord, we just, um, we come and just take these next couple moments. Lord, I pray that you do your great work right now, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Do something in the hearts and the lives. For those of you who you're a victim of one of these things we talked about. Maybe you're a victim of favoritism and you were the defavored one and you have some, all these hurtful memories, wasted years. You've never grieved over it. You've never come to a place of acceptance. You've never gone to God and said, really, God, I forgive them. Why not take a step? You're probably, you're somewhere along the line, somewhere on that. Take a step in that way. Just say, God, help me to break the lineage. Break anything from passing on, not just to my kids or my grandkids, but also to other people. The Lord would say to you that you are his favored. You are his favored. So maybe you weren't the favored of your parent, but God says you're his favorite. And he loves you with an everlasting love. He's watching over you. He cares for you. He hurts with you. And he's committed not just to you, but to those you want to bless, those you care about. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you can dispense your love so liberally to all of us. Lord, today I, I pray for a unique, powerful healing in the hearts of those who you're, you're here, and it's not new to you. I didn't really like, you know, oh, wow, 
You know, there's something new. It's just we, when we identify it, we are used to just saying, I don't feel comfortable there. That hurts too much. There's nothing I can do about it. And today I want to challenge that and say, today God says, no, you can actually, through Christ and the power of God, you can change things. You can change not just your attitude, but the way, it, in, in, the way you react to other people. What's passed on. Right now, this is your moment. Would you do that? Just say, God, I come to you. I forgive so-and-so. I, and just name them. I forgive them for their favoritism. Would you say, God, from this day forward, I'm going to walk in forgiveness. If you're the person who has been favored, you're, you, we're giving out favor, would, instead of making excuses or defending yourself, would you say, God, forgive me. I could have done this a little better. Give me the strength to go and get things right. Maybe there's a banner over your family, a family of deception, a family of alcoholism, of abuse, something of divorce. Same thing goes there. Say, God, by the power of Christ, I want to step into the strength that comes from being a Christ follower. Maybe you were like me and you're a first-generation Christian. You go, today's a new day for me. I'm not going to just fulfill the curse that's been passed down. There is power in the blood. There is power in what Christ did on the cross. And that does, that is the beginning point, though. There is, the power comes by putting your faith in Jesus. If you've never done that, would you do that right now? Say, in Jesus' name, Lord, I put my faith in you. I don't understand it all, but today I want to follow you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.